Greetings, friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church just here in Lawrence. And uh, I come out here this, this morning, almost this afternoon, uh, with a couple of friends of mine to preach to you the gospel of grace, to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ, to call you to eternal life in the Son of God. We are here to, to call out sin and to warn you about sin, to warn you about the wrath of God, which is to come upon the wicked but also to show you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. He saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, as Acts 2.20 tells us. Friends, we're here to plead with you, to plead with you concerning your soul. We want you to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. See, friends, by default, all mankind, every human being on the face of the earth, is an enemy with God, is at enmity and war with God. And they need to be reconciled. And the, the terms of peace that God has offered, the terms of peace that God has put forth for His enemies to enter into, is the work of Jesus Christ, is the death of Christ upon the cross, is the resurrection of Christ. Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. And it is so, therefore, it is, it is He who we proclaim unto you. And it is for His glory that we are out here this morning to bring Him honor and praise, to bring the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, glory and praise and honor, all the praise that is due unto Him for accomplishing salvation for His people. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is found in the book of Romans. It is in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Beginning in verse 9. Romans chapter 3 verse 9. The Apostle Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And he writes these words. Thank you, thank you. He says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And that is the issue that I would like to deal with this morning. That there is none righteous, not even one. That not one of the children of men not a single human on the face of the earth, certainly not myself or you. None of us are righteous. In fact, we are the opposite. We are the polar opposite. We are unrighteous and unholy. We have become defiled by sin. Sin in its universal reach has touched all mankind and corrupted every soul of man. In fact, it is our strong exhortation to you this morning that you would not think so highly of yourself and be so proud as to think that you are without sin, that you are without transgression, that your soul is pure before God. For as the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, If we say that we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Friends, if you claim to be without sin, to be without iniquity, then you are right now at this present moment in the process of deceiving yourself. And we do not want that for you. We don't want you to be self-deluded and self-deceived. Instead, we want you to be self-aware, self-aware of your sin, so that, that ultimately pushes you to embrace the Savior. Sin is great, yes, but Christ is a greater Savior. Christ is a sufficient Savior. And He lives to make intercession 
for those who draw near to God through Him. And so come to Christ and believe upon Him for eternal life. But sin does not only affect us all at one point in time, no. But sin affects us all from conception. Sin is something which we have upon us, not something that we learn from early years in life or later on in life. Sin is not a learned thing. It is, an, it is built into us. It is a part of our fallen nature. That is why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 51 verse 5, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. My friends, it is there in us, present even from conception, we are corrupt. Even from conception, we are tainted by the disease of sin. And ultimately, it brings upon us eternal death and damnation of soul. Sin, though it may provide a passing pleasure for a season, it ultimately will damn your soul. And so it is our desire to point you to the Savior that you would not be eternally lost, that you would not be thrown into hell, but that you would be received into glory because of the power of the blood of Christ. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, he said, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Grace, my friends, free grace, the offer of salvation is extended forth unto all people. The offer of salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is ultimately that offer of salvation, that glorious gospel, that I seek to make known this morning to you. But before I do, I'd like to consider the context of this passage here in Romans, in Romans chapter 3, to consider where Paul has gone and where he is going to go in, in the future verses. He has already begun in, in chapter 3, explaining the privileges and here contextually speaking in his day he was dealing with the Jewish people the Jewish nation who had for the most part rejected the gospel of Christ and so he asked the question in verse 1 then what advantage has the Jew or what is the benefit of circumcision in other words in, in Paul's day the Jewish people had rejected the gospel however they did have light they had some light given unto them by God. In fact, they were entrusted with the oracles of God, entrusted with the Old Testament Scriptures. And yet they could not see that those Scriptures testified to the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says in verse 2. He says, Great in every respect, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And then the next few verses, he continues to talk about God's truth and our sin. He contrasts these ideas. He talks about the faithfulness of God. And then that is where we find ourselves in verse 9. This is really a concluding phrase, but also it opens up a new section here that he is discussing, and a new, a new subject that Paul is wanting to convey. So he says in verse 9, What then are we better than they? In other words, the Jewish people. So he comes here to this verse and he says, Are we better than the unbeliever? And we will see in a moment that it is no, because there is none righteous. All are under the curse of sin. And so therefore, let us consider this verse. Beginning in verse 9, Paul says, What then are we better than they? So he's asking the question, Are we better than the unbeliever? Are we as believers better than the unbeliever? What does he say? Three words. Not at all. Not an ounce. Not a little bit. Continues on in verse 9. 
For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. In other words, every person without exception, every person, does not matter the color of your skin or where you've come from or what your place in society is or how much money you make. If you are a human being, then you've been tainted by the curse of sin. There's not a racial divide. Sin does not see race. Sin does not see someone's place in society. Sin corrupts every soul of man. And that is why every person must embrace Christ. That is why every person must flee to Christ, lest they be lost eternally. And then he cites an Old Testament text. He cites the Scripture as the basis for his apostolic authority, as the basis for his preaching. He begins in verse 10, or continues, I should say. He says, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. That excludes every person. What does it mean to be righteous? Righteous is conformity to the character of God. Conformity to the law of God in obedience to God. It is literally taken from the word right. That which is right. And it says, no one is right. No one is righteous. In fact, as I said earlier, we are unrighteous. We are the opposite of righteous. And even in the next few verses, he gives a sweeping condemnation. It's as if what he just wrote in verse 10 isn't enough. He's got to bring more scriptures. He's got to continue the quotation to, to add to this, to give a further emphasis. So he continues in verse 11. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So there we have it. That is the state of the lost outside of Christ. That is your state if you are outside of Christ. And I plead with you not to think any higher of yourself than what is written here in this text. This is the wickedness of man's heart unraveled and exposed for us. It's as if it's hidden in a closet and Paul swings the door open and we see all its filth there before us. It's raw. It's gory. It's vulgar. Sin is wicked and perverse. We even see it tainting our culture today. I thought about when it says there in that verse, in verse 15, their, their feet are swift to shed blood. I think about our own culture. We live in a culture of death, friends. Our nation slaughters 3,000 babies a day in their mother's womb, the safest place that a child can abide. There's a holocaust in the land, my friends, the holocaust of abortion, where so-called doctors literally rip a, 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 a little child apart in its mother's womb. What a great evil. It's awful to kill a man while he's out in the field working. It is worse to kill a man while he is in the safety of his home sleeping. How much e more evil is it when a child is in, the, is in the tender care of its mother's womb? That shows us the wickedness of man's heart. And so therefore it is my desire that you are able to say in agreement with the Apostle Paul, truly there is none righteous, not even one. I said earlier though, righteousness is conformity to the character of God. But we ask ourselves, what is the character of God? Who is God? Who is the God of Scripture? Who is the God who has made us? The God of glory. Well, firstly, God is triune. God is three in one. Three eternal persons, yet one essence being in nature. 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God is to be worshipped as Trinity, as Triune, because God is Triune. Also, and this seems very clear from the text, but I ought to point it out, God is righteous. God is right. We are unrighteous, and God is righteous. He is perfect in all His ways, righteous in all His deeds. He is also just. He's a just judge. In fact, the book of Genesis says He's the just judge of all the earth. Jesus talked about when God is going to judge the wicked. God is a just judge. He's also holy. He's unapproachable in His holiness. What does holy mean? It means sanctified, set apart. God is set apart from all that is perverse and wicked and evil. God is holy. A good display of this, a representation of this, is in Isaiah 6 when the prophet Isaiah is granted a, a great privilege of being able to, to behold the glory of God. Look at what he says in verse 1 of Isaiah 6. He says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out. While the temple was filling with smoke, then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, my friends, God is holy. Three times thrice fold holy. The angels in glory are crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy. They're, they're, it's as if they, they cannot find the adequate words to use in description of God's holiness and His beauty and His perfection. And so they are just repeating themselves over and over and over to show emphasis, to add emphasis. God is holy. No man can stand in His presence, my friends. The wicked cannot approach a holy God. There is a vast chasm between the sinner and God because the God of glory is holy and the sinner is unholy. They are defiled and profane. They are unclean because of their sin. Also, when we consider the attributes of God, the character of God, we need to understand that God is all-powerful, almighty, and all things are in His hands. He controls all things so that whatsoever comes to pass is according to His decree. He decreed it, my friends. God is gracious and compassionate. Merciful, that is true. Abounding in loving kindness. God is patient with the wicked. Scripture clearly presents that. But these attributes of God even the attribute of God, uh, the, the attribute of love, that God is love, 1 John 4, 8. We need to understand that these attributes of God do not negate the others. They don't cancel each other out. Many people would like to believe in a God who is only loving and gracious and compassionate and who is not just and not holy and not righteous. Such a God is no God at all, but is an idol, is a figment of their imagination. It is a God who suits their own lusts. See, the heart of man is lusting. It's lustful. And it's lusting after false gods. It's lusting after a God that, that is comfortable. God is love, my friends, but that is in accordance with His holiness. That is in accordance with His justice. Away with weak preaching that is found in the churches of Lawrence County. Away with the man-centered preaching that is found in churches in Lawrence County. And may there be God-centered and Christ-exalting preaching. May there be preaching that seeks not to comfort man, but to bring glory to God. My friends, God is for God. God is for His own glory and praise. 
God is jealous, my friends. Not in the sinful sense, but in the righteous sense. God is jealous for His own glory and own praise and honor. That is why God told the Israelites through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 48.11, He said, For my own sake, for my own sake I will act. How can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? God is jealous for His glory. Therefore, in the perfection of God, in the, in the absolute moral purity of God, what did God do? He brought forth His law. He brought forth the eternal moral law of God, the, the perfect law of God. And if you've grown up in church, then perhaps you are familiar with the law of God. Perhaps you are familiar with the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are there for a specific purpose. They are there to show us the character of God and the character of man in light of the character of God. They are there to show us who God is and who we are in light of who God is. When we go to Exodus 20 and we think about those commands, where God says in verse 12, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. My friends, these commands that God gave, and I did not even read all of them, they show us the character of God. You shall not murder. God is not a murdering God. Certainly not. He does not act wickedly. And therefore, He commands men, He commands all men not to murder. You shall not commit adultery. Why does God desire that spouses be faithful to one another? Because God is a, is a perfect, covenant-keeping, faithful God. His faithfulness never ends. It does not fail. You shall not steal. Certainly God is not a thief. God owns all things. He has divine prerogative over all things. And He has the right to command us as to what we ought to do with that which He owns. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In other words, that is condemning lying. God is not a liar. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us it is impossible for God to lie. So herein do we find the character of God. The law is like a mirror. The law is like a mirror, my friends, and it reflects to us a glorious image, a glorious picture. The most beautiful image, the most beautiful picture, and that is the character of God. Who God is. In fact, going back to Romans chapter 3 there in, in verse 10 when it says, There is none righteous, not even one. We could change that a little bit and say that God is righteous. God is righteous, my friends. And therefore do we find the righteous law of God. But we also see something else when we look at God's law. We see one more thing, my friends. One more thing, and it is this. Our character. Our character in light of the character of God. Our unholiness in light of the holiness of God. Those commands that I just looked at. Honor your father and mother. Have you perfectly honored your father and mother? Well, certainly not. Therefore, you are condemned. You are guilty of breaking God's law. You shall not murder. You say, listen, I've never killed anybody. I've never murdered somebody. However, Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you have anger in your heart towards someone else, it is equated with murder. God sees it the same. God sees the mind, friends. God sees the heart. And He sees that it is wicked. And that it is perverse. He does not see inherent goodness. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. Wicked. 
You shall not commit adultery. You say again, I've been faithful to my spouse. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you commit adultery already with her in your heart. You men, when you watch the football games on TV and you see those cheerleaders, are you lusting? Or when you go on the internet and watch pornography, certainly you're, you're lusting. You're committing adultery. You've broken God's law. You shall not steal, verse 15 of Exodus 20. Have you ever stolen something? Even if it's small, it's not about the value of the item. It's about the act of evil, the act of wickedness that you've committed. Taking something that was not yours. That you had no right taking for your own possession. Then you are condemned. Lastly, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Have you lied before? Have you lied in your life? Or perhaps have you omitted truth? Have you held back something you ought to have told someone? That also is lying. That's deceit. My friends, you're condemned. And what does the Bible tell us? All liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Friends, flee to Jesus Christ for eternal life. He forgives sinners because He died for His people. He died for sinners, my friends. It is my cry to you that you would see your sin, but that you would see the sufficiency of the Savior, that you would see Christ in all His glory through the eye of faith, that you would consider the Gospel, the good news, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So please, trust on Christ alone. But going back to the law of God, we find therefore that we have broken God's law, that we are condemned, that we are guilty. And I myself am not exempt from this. I'm not keeping myself out of this. I'm in this. I've broken the law and I likewise, just as you do, deserve hell. What does Nahum chapter 1 tell us? Verse 2, the Lord, or excuse me, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. My friends, I want you to understand this. God in His holiness, having given His law and us having broken it, reserves wrath for His enemies. God reserves wrath for the wicked. And what is... God's ultimate punishment specifically for the wicked. Well, it is that place that Jesus spoke on more than He did about heaven. And it is a place called hell. It is a place called, uh, called uh, the lake of fire, the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of outer darkness. The place of an unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, my friends. That is why Paul said it back in, the, in one chapter back in, in chapter 2 of Romans, verse 9. He says, There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. This is what Jesus had to say about hell in Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life cri crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47, if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. My friends, hell is a place of torment for the wicked. It is a place that is eternal. It never ends. The torments of those who are in hell never end. 
Let the cries of the damned cause you to fear God. Let the cries of those who are in hell at this moment receiving the due penalty for their sins. Let those moans of those who are being tormented for their sins move you to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible challenges us to fear God, to fear the Lord, to, to have a reverence for God. Friends, don't lose your soul for your sins. Many are on the road to destruction. Jesus said in Matthew 7, there are many on the path to destruction. Friends, I plead with you to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, to cling to Christ for eternal life. He will not cast you out. He will not cast anyone out who comes to Him and pleads for eternal life. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 11, he said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My friends, God's wrath is that which ought to be feared. Yes, that is true. But in light of that, we must see the grace of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ that God has not left us without hope but has sent His Son into the world to give lost sinners hope in Christ. But nonetheless, we are all condemned to hell without any hope. Justly, and here's the thing also, no good deeds can, can get us out of this predicament. No good deeds can rescue us. It would be like a murderer here in South Carolina who has been convicted of murder, telling a judge right before they're about to be sentenced, well, judge, don't worry, I've given to charity, I've, I've done nice things in my life, I'm going to go to church from now on, I've repented, I'll stop murdering people. The judge is going to say, well, that's great, but you have still broken the law and you deserve punishment for your law breaking. And it is the same way with God, only more so. God is just. And it doesn't matter if you have good resolve now. Your sin in the past will damn you. And even your good resolve now is not good. It's tainted by sin. Even our good deeds are tainted by sin. We are sinful creatures. And so truly, we are without hope. Without hope. Condemned to hell. And we cannot save ourselves. We are lost eternally. But that is where the Gospel comes in, my friends. That is where the good news of Jesus Christ comes in and gives us great hope. The light of the Gospel shines brightly upon our darkened souls as we behold its glory. My friends, I have great news to bring unto you. That God, the Father, being rich in His love for His people, set them aside from the, sound, the foundation of the world. He set aside His elect for glory. He chose His people. He predestined them to life, as Ephesians 1 says. And then He covenanted with the Son, with the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for these people. He commissioned His Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and die for this elect people. The, the stipulation was that if Christ were to die for us and buy our salvation, that the Father would reward Him Give Him the throne of His father David and He would reign over the people of God forever and ever. He would have the church as His bride, as His own people, for His own possession, for His own glory. And Christ agreed. He agreed with the Father. And therefore, this glorious covenant of redemption was enacted. And even the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, joined in on this and agreed to empower Christ to do what He did in His perfect life and then to apply the benefit of His work to the hearts of the elect. This is tr Trinitarian salvation, my friends. Salvation accomplished by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Perfect unity, perfect agreement. And so, 
when the fullness of the times came, what happened? The second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, came down to earth and dwelt among men. He came and He dwelt among sinners. Galatians 4.4 4 puts it like this, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Christ came to save His people from their sins. Matthew one twenty one says that. That Jesus is to be called Jesus. He, this, that was the angel speaking to Joseph. He said, you will call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. And so Jesus Christ comes born of a virgin, born under the law, and He fulfills the law of God. Consider this, my friends, how you have broken God's law and broken His commands. But then consider this, that Christ has come in and in the place of sinful people has kept the law of God, has held fast to the commands that the Father gave, and has lived in perfect submission and in obedience to the commands of God. That is why the Lord Jesus Himself could say in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 17, He said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law of God. And He did that very thing. How do we know that? Two chapters back in Matthew 3, verse 17. What does it say? It says, And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, Now this is the Father speaking audibly from heaven. He says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Christ pleased the Father. He kept the law of God. He never lied. He never stole. He never blasphemed. He honored His father and mother. He never idolized. He loved the Lord as God with all His heart, mind, soul, and strength. And He loved His neighbor as Himself. And then to speak of the climax of Christ's ministry. What do we find? We find the cross of Jesus Christ. My friends, I'm here to make known the glories of the cross of Christ. To preach Christ and Him crucified. So Jesus Christ, in submission to the will of the Father, in perfect reverential obedience laid his side his privileges, laid his life down, and he was beat, and he was whipped, and he was spat upon. He was made a public mockery. He was even uh, abandoned by his own disciples. And he was nailed to a Roman cross. And upon that cross, he suffered for the sins of the elect. He suffered for the sins of the people of God. He bore the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. We saw earlier that God is wrathful, that God is a wrath-filled judge. But in His love, in His grace toward His church, He pours out that wrath on Christ. He unleashes the full fury of His eternal damnation upon the wicked, upon His Son. That is why Isaiah 53.10 simply says this, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. Christ's death on that cross is not just some example. It's not just some example for us to look at and see, wow, we need to be dedicated to God, even to death. No, it is so much more than that. The death of Jesus Christ upon the cross was a death unto God. It was a death unto the Father. This kind of preaching, this gospel is offensive, my friends. This gospel is offensive to the lost. But it's nonetheless the true gospel. On that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath of the Father was put on Christ. What is hell? It is where God unleashes His wrath upon the wicked. Therefore, what is the cross of Jesus Christ? The Father unleashes His wrath on His Son and He satisfies it. He puts it away. Every ounce, every drop of His just wrath 
is put away and it is gone. Jesus at the cross cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then as the book of John tells us, at that moment of his death, he cried out to telestai. One word translated, it is finished. The work of salvation is complete. The salvation for the people of God is sealed. It is set in stone and not anything, not a single thing in the creation of God can separate the people of God from the love of Jesus Christ. And so therefore we find the cross of Christ to be glorious. If you claim to be a Christian and this gospel is offensive to you, it is because you are perishing and you're not a Christian. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness to you, is not special to you, it's because you're lost. God bless you, sir. It's because you are lost. I don't care whether some pastors told you you're a Christian. I don't care whether you've had some silly experience in a church. The question is, is the cross of Jesus Christ the power of God to you? Is it precious to you? Is Jesus Christ the pearl of great price? Or is He just some accessory to ease your conscience? Three days later, after dying for the church, what happened? Christ was raised from the dead. The Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His sacrifice as a sufficient payment for our sins. That Jesus had bought our salvation. That Jesus had purchased our redemption by His precious blood. I love the way Romans 4.25 says, and this is very close to the verse that we're looking at. Next chapter over, Romans 4.25, Paul writes, He, that's Christ, who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has great significance and great meaning. It was a public display that the Father had received Christ's work at the cross as sufficient payment. And so Christ is alive today, never to die again. Death has no power over Him. He is alive, my friends. He is risen. He is not there in that tomb anymore. He is risen. God bless you, man. Praise the Lord Jesus. And so therefore, He is alive. I love what Jesus said in, in um, John 11.25. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if He dies. And my friends, there is more great news. Christ not only was raised from the dead on the third day, but after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, He ascended into heaven. He bodily ascended from the top of the Mount of Olives there as His disciples were looking on into glory. And what does the book of Hebrews tell us? Well, I'll turn there. Hebrews 1.3 says, And He is the radiance of His glory, that's speaking of Christ here, and the exact representation of His nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ has done the work of salvation once for all. See, in the Old Testament, in the temple, the priests continually had to stand up. There was nowhere to sit inside the temple to symbolize the fact that their work was continual, that it never stopped, that they had to work day after day after day. And then Christ comes in as high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And he sits down at the right hand of majesty on high and salvation is accomplished. And there is no more work that needeth to be done. That is why the Roman Catholic Mass is such a blasphemy. 
because it re-sacrifices Christ, supposedly. Christ does not need to be sacrificed again and again. His one-time sacrifice is enough for all the saints of all the ages. And so therefore the call of the gospel, the call of the gospel, the outward call is this, repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1.15 says, Jesus says in Mark 1.15, He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The work of salvation is done. And so the call is to repent and believe the gospel. Repentance means that you see your sin. You see that you're a bankrupt sinner. That you deserve hell for your sins. That you are lost eternally apart from Christ. That you deserve to be damned. And then it is a, it is a resolve to flee sin. To flee iniquity. To flee transgression. And to flee to Christ. That is repentance. And then the second thing, belief. Belief is simply this, to take God at His Word. But it's not some false belief as many people who sit in churches today have. It's not some pseudo-faith. It's not just saying and just intellectually believing. It is a deep conviction within the soul. My friends, belief is the work of God upon the heart of man. In fact, the two words that are used in the New Testament for belief and faith, pisto, uh, pistuo and pistis, are derived from a Greek word that means to persuade. We are persuaded by the Holy Spirit of God, of the, the validity of the Gospel, of the veracity of the truth of the cross, and therefore we believe it. Repentance and faith are both works of God upon the heart of man. It's not something you can conjure up within yourself. However, you are responsible. You are responsible, my friends, concerning whether or not you have repented and believed. Please, I plead with you to repent and believe the Gospel. And so in light of the call of the Gospel, here is the promise of the Gospel. Here is the promise divinely given by God. Those who repent and believe the Gospel will be forgiven of all sin. All sin will be forgiven. That's why Jesus could say to His disciples in Luke 24, 46, He said, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that forget repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. And all who believe on Him receive full forgiveness of sin. Full forgiveness of all of their transgressions because of the work of Christ upon the cross. The Father forgives them of all sin, past, present, and future, because Jesus died for all their sin, past, present, and future. Christ is not bound by time. Also, not only that, but the sinner receives imputed righteousness. In Philippians 3, Paul says in verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. My friends, Paul's hope, one of the most holy men in his day, his hope for salvation was that he was receiving from God perfect righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
The Father imputes to the account of the believer the righteousness of Christ. In other words, He looks upon the sinner as if they lived Jesus' life because He looked upon Christ as if He lived their life. That's the exchange of the Gospel, friends. Jesus takes my sin. Jesus takes my filth. And I receive His righteousness, that perfect garment of righteousness, so that when I stand before the Father, I am seen as perfect. And that brings us right back to Romans 3, verse 10. When it says, there is none righteous, not even one. The Gospel undoes what sin has done. The Gospel restores the sinner to a right standing with God. It brings back that which was present in the garden. Communion with God. Right standing before the Creator. So that the sinner is righteous. Not because they inherently have performed, but because God regards them as righteous because of Jesus Christ. On the account of Christ for the sake of Jesus Christ. You see that, my friends? God does not save sinners for our own sake or because of our own merit. He saves us on Jesus' merit and on Jesus' account and for Jesus' sake and for Jesus' glory, my friends. That is the promise of the Gospel. That is the glory of the Gospel. Restoring what the enemy, what Satan stole, what Satan caused to happen. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and He has done that single-handedly. The broad-shouldered strong Savior has accomplished salvation for His people, for His own glory. But I also want to address, in these, in these few minutes that I have left, I want to address something that is of pressing importance. And it is something which is right now happening in this very county on practically every corner. And it is false conversion. False conversion. My friends, I want you to understand something. The one who has been saved by the grace of God, the sinner who has been regenerated, who has been recreated by the power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, will not continue on in blatant rebellion and sin. They will not continue on in their pornography and in their drunkenness and in their drug abuse and their selfishness and their pride. They will not continue on living for themselves. They will be changed. God does not save people and then just leave them to live however they want. When God saves a man or saves, saves a woman or saves a child, there is a radical life transformation that takes place. That's why Paul could write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. They are a new creation. God has raised them to spiritual life. That's why John could write in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. He says, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in him the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him, ought Himself to walk in the same manner as He walked. My friends, salvation is not accomplished by your work. However, salvation is evidenced by your work. If you want to know whether you've been genuinely born again, don't look pa back in the past to some experience you had. Don't look back in the past to what some preacher or some goofy evangelist told you. Look to your present life right now and ask yourself, do I live for Christ? Do I desire holiness? Do I desire prayer and the Word of God and the fellowship of the saints? Do I delight in sharing the Gospel with others? Or do I even do that at all? And based off of your answering of these questions, you will know whether you're genuinely regenerate or not. No greater place in all the New Testament can I turn for this other than Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, 
Beginning in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? If you want to know the state of your soul, look at your life. Look at your affections. Look at your actions. That is how you know whether the tree is good or bad. He continues in verse 8. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every good tree, or excuse me, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, the fires of hell. It doesn't matter what you say with your lips. You say you're a Christian, it doesn't matter. How do you live? If, let's say, suppose for a moment if I was married and I told my wife that I loved her and then I went around town sleeping with countless number of women. Would I truly love her? No, I would not. I'd be a liar. And it would not matter how many times I said it with my mouth. My actions say otherwise. And how true that is for people who sit in Southern Baptist churches and Church of God churches and uh, Presbyterian churches here in Lawrence County who sit in those pews and are hypocrites six days a week. And then they come in and they act as if they're converted and they're lost and they're on their way to damnation. There are many on the road to destruction. I myself, I was a false convert for eight years. Eight years of my life, I lived as a hypocrite. Said I was saved, said I was converted, but I was self-deluded. I was lying to myself. But going back to verse 19 there, after he says, every good tree that does not bear, or every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Verse 20, so then you will know them by their fruits. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform any miracles. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There are many people who sit in churches week in and week out here in Lawrence County who will hear that very phrase come from the lips of Christ on the day of judgment. So it is my cry to you to examine yourself and to see whether you're in the faith. This is all by grace. Salvation is all by the free grace of God. Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Unmerited favor. Favor that is not worked for. That is the grace of God, my friends. And this gospel is not only for the lost, it is for the saint. It is for the child of God to feed upon. Brethren, you Christians out here, it's my challenge, it's my encouragement to you to feed upon the gospel, to feast upon the manna from heaven, to feast upon this precious, nourishing spiritual truth for us. This is for the Christian. This is the daily gospel, the minute-by-minute -minute gospel that we need. Otherwise, we will fall into self-righteousness or licentiousness. All by grace. All by the free grace of God. I love what Paul says in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. It's all of God's grace, my friends. Let grace transform you today for the glory of God. You who are lost, you pagans, you unchurched, flee your sin. Repent of your drunkenness, your pornography, your pride. And embrace Christ. Embrace Jesus Christ. You religious folks, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. 
to see whether you know Christ. And if you do, praise God. And if you don't, repent and believe the gospel. By your actions, you will know whether you know Christ. And my brethren, my fellow Christians, feed upon the gospel and preach it to the lost. Share it with the lost. This is the only hope that a sinner ever will have before God. So going back to Romans 3, we have seen here in conclusion, in Romans 3, in verses 9 through 10, that all people are under sin, without distinction. There is none righteous, not even one. But we have considered, while that is true, while that is true that we've sinned and we deserve hell, Christ came into the world to save sinners, to die for His people and to rise again. And all who embrace Christ, all who fling themselves upon the mercy of God as is revealed in Jesus, will be saved. And this salvation, this great salvation, is by the grace of God and it is for the glory of God. It is all for the glory of God. God has done all this to bring His name, praise, and glory, and honor. God is jealous for His glory. I made note of that earlier as I began preaching. God is for God. God is for His own glory. And so therefore we find in Romans chapter 11, Paul writes these words. In verse 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who was first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to Christ Jesus the Lord be all glory and praise and honor forever and ever. Amen and amen.